So we are meeting here in Vienna at the same place where EST was founded in 1992 and necessarily after 20 years we live in different times. It is not my task to discuss here how EST has changed in these two decades. More competent colleagues have addressed and will address that task. Nor will I be sketching or will be capable of sketching, of course, a program of what EST will be like or should become in the next 20 years. The name of our Society for Translation Studies suggests that we are a European institution. Of course, we are not an exclusively European institution. So what are we? How much Europeanness does our society carry? How Eurocentric are we? Can we ever talk of a European perspective on translation studies or of a European perspective on translation? The very name EST seems to be biased or at least erroneous and deceptive. Beginning to discuss these questions around EST's alleged Europeanness, it may be helpful to cite Umberto Eco's claim, which is also the title of my lecture, the language of Europe is translation. What does Eco mean with these words? What is the translation concept which underpins that statement? What Europe is Eco actually talking about? And in what way might his statement help us to rethink and eventually also to reformulate some of uh, our society's policies and maybe also our society's name? Let me start my lecture with a historical spotlight on the place, the place where Est started and where we are now, Vienna. As Franz told, uh, told us already, one of my research, uh, one of my special research interests has been the role of translating and interpreting in the late Habsburg monarchy. So I'm afraid you won't be spared some historical remarks on the translation space of the place. Against this background, I will, in my lecture, unfold Umberto Eco's comment, first discussing the concept of Europeanness, and the political stance behind prevalent notions of Europe, and then exploring the translation concept underlying Umberto Eco's claim. To conclude, I will discuss the implications of these debates for EST and the future challenges. I claim it is no coincidence that EST was founded in Vienna. Vienna has traditionally been a center of plurilinguality and pluriculturality, so for different reasons over the centuries. And it goes almost without saying that plurilinguality and pluriculturality are closely connected with the activity of translation and interpreting. As the center of a huge empire for several hundred years, the city attracted millions of internal migrants flocking from all over the empire, while in the last 70 years or so after the Second World War, Vienna, like many other industrial cities, uh, industri cities in the industrialist world, has symbolized the often delusive hope of thousands and thousands of political and economic refugees particularly from so-called third world countries and of course from regions of war. Um, in the last, let's say, 20 years, people coming from especially the Yugoslavian war area. From the late 13th century, Vienna was the capital of the gradually growing Habsburg Empire. At the end of the 19th century, about 50 million people were speaking 11 official different languages in the monarchy. The variants, of course, not included. The 1910 statistics of the Habsburg monarchy's nationalities shows its Babelian cultural and linguistic diversity. The German-speaking and Hungarian nationalities are the largest groups, followed by Czechs, Poles, Ukrainians, Romanians, Croatians, Serbs, <laughs> Slovaks and Slovenes, and finally the Italians and Ladines. 
I'd like to give you just one example to illustrate the monarchist diversity of culture and language. As in any other country every year, and sometimes more often, the Habsburg monarchy organized a ceremony to swear in its new recruits. The recruits solemnly swore that they would support and defend the Habsburg constitution against all enemies and that they would obey the orders of the emperor. Please imagine such a scene in some of the huge barrack squares in Vienna with hundreds of young recruits and a ceremonious atmosphere. The aspect which interests me here is that of language and religious confession. Detailed documentation on the ceremonies tell us that in some cases they had to be carried out in up to 10 languages and with the participation of military clergymen of seven different religious confessions. The oaths were read out in each language in turn and repeated by the speakers of that language. Within this context of plurilingualism, it is my claim that translation and interpreting in the multifaceted forms in which it was practiced in the late Habsburg monarchy very significantly contributed to the construction of cultures in the Habsburg space. In what follows, I will focus particularly on the issue of migration as a key concept of that claim. In the economic and political functioning of the monarchy, migration was a central issue. Migration was practiced on different levels. On the one hand, large numbers of people emigrated to the big cities in search of work. These population shifts are best documented in the population figures for Vienna. Between 1880 and 1900, the population grew by 130%. While for the foregoing 20 years, the rate of increase had been only 20%, 25%. The figures for female servants are perhaps the most dramatic. In 1890, for instance, only 7.3% of female servants in Vienna, working in Vienna, originally came from the city. On the other hand, civil servants who were moved between posts somewhere in the vast area of the monarchy were also important carriers of transfer processes. The following vivid and somewhat sarcastic contemporary description illustrates the role of migration very well. In order for the Viennese man to lead his dreamy, unpunctual life rich in little joys and pleasures, a precision machine is at work quietly and unobtrusively. Its untiring and industrious arms are the checks. They are our tailors and make our most beautiful clothes. They are our shoemakers and make our hands some footwear. Their fiddles and clarinets play our beautiful music. They cook our good, healthy food. They craft and polish our beautiful furniture. They drive our beautiful coaches, and the abundant priests of the Bohemian wet nurses feed the Viennese babies. Today, Austria is a small country, which was catapulted from its marginal position back to the center of Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Of its eight point million inhabitants, 1.4 million, million, uh, million were not born in Austria. The great majority of these speak the languages of the ex Habsburg, Habsburg crown lands, with the addition of Turkish, which has become one of the major languages spoken by migrants. Habsburg's legacy is thus clearly discernible. In other words, both socio-geographically and historically, the Viennese ground was prepared to host the foundation of Est in 1992. So let me discuss Europe's Europeanness. Est stands for European Society for Translation Studies. In a retrospective view on the occasion of the society's 20th anniversary, 
It seems inevitable to interrogate, at least briefly, some of the name's components. Both European and translation offer themselves conspicuously for, for any further consideration, due not least to some revolutionary developments, both in these last two decades, both on a historical and geopolitical and on an epistemological level. So what Europe do we mean when we talk about Est? As we know, historically motivated assumptions of European supremacy fossilized in the course of, centu of centuries have created a contradictory situation. This political, ideological and cultural supremacy, along with the discourses which substantiated it, has been just justified by appeals to notion of civilization, development and progress. In addition, and even more destructively, it has been assumed that such ideas are universal. Since Edward Said's Orientalism, we have been aware that what is called European identity is based on an alleged uniqueness of the region's cultural tradition and a consequence, consequent disparagement of the culture of the other. As these assumptions and screening mechanisms begin to, scrum, to crumble, Europe's self-conception has entered a severe crisis. The neoliberal logics connected to that crisis becomes obvious in some parts of the European Union's policies of culture and language. With its 2003 report on cultural industries, the European Parliament called upon the Union to devise, quote, a cultural policy which sets out the economic conditions for the development of the European cultural model. As evoked by the report, this model is built primarily on economic aspects and, in the longer term, sees cultural policies as the new motor for economic growth. In such a context, linguist Abraham Deswan stresses that the nature of language in the context of globalization is defined by the economic value, so that language is treated as an economic good for export and import. This example testifies to an understanding of culture uh, and language that seems to be inscribed in the economic logic of the Union. In these circumstances, I'm convinced that we need a reformulation of our task as translators, interpreters, and scholars that firstly include ideas, assumptions, and doubts regarding who and what is called European outside the European Union, and that secondly takes rigorous account of the perspective of migrants. Who is better placed to pick up this challenge than us? The agents in the global European game who are directly involved in both the everyday functioning of the European Union and the critical assessment of that functioning from a scholarly point of view. Debate on the European Union has become a commonplace in translation studies scholarly discourse. This may be due to the Union's central position as an employer, absorbing many of our graduates, but at the same time, the, U the European Union certainly shapes wide areas of our research agendas. Through our adoption of models promul promulgated by the Union, and of course, through the Union's funding of higher, of bigger research projects. Often, the resulting strong focus on European issues in our research falls on fertile ground, building on historically evolved structures. Let's remember that Schleiermacher favored the foreignizing model of translation not to introduce the foreign to German culture with a lofty ethical gesture, but rather to romantically renew and strengthen the shaping of, um, 
a national language as a powerful tool to promote what was called the German idea and thus to mold a national cultural community. Remember that colonialism originated in the arrogance of alleged European intellectual and political superiority, of course nourished and sustained by religious ideas and institutions. And remember the role of translation and interpreting played in helping to promote this superiority. Remember the universality of Latin in the European Middle Ages and the impact uh, as the language of the learned, of the scholars, and the impact of this universality far into the 19th century, when intellectuals right across Europe were convinced that the best way to learn one's mother tongue was with the help of Latin translations. So Eurocentrism has many roots. But how can we measure Eurocentrism in translation studies? In terms of the theorists we draw on, then Foucault or Bourdieu have, of course, considerably Eurocentrized our discipline. Or in terms of the material we work on, or of the demographic structure of translation studies scholars, Europeans versus non-Europeans, and is a European defined as someone with an EU passport? As, for instance, according to our website's intranet, actual intranet, presently counts 239 paying, I stress paying, members. Not surprisingly, the large majority of EST's members are women, 177 compared with 62 male members. 197, or 82% of all members, are working in the European Union. 26, or 11%, live in other European countries, including Russia, Ukraine, and Turkey. And 16 members come from or work outside Europe. This means that 93% of EST members come from or work in European countries. In other words, the working locations of our members, at least, are predominantly in what we geographically call Europe, meaning both EU and non-EU countries. In the context of this discussion, I more than warmly welcome the intriguing special issue on Eurocentrism in translation studies in the journal Translation and Interpreting Studies, edited in 2011 by Peter Flynn and Luc van Dorsler. It transiently points out the problematic usage of geographically based terms to describe developments in our worldwide discipline. Out of the many different and convincing arguments raised in this special issue, I would like to mention Dirk de la Bastida's idea that our growing post-colonial sensibility the greater presence and visibility of non-Western scholars in academia and the overall erosion of the Western hegemony has brought about publications which deal more critically with problems arising from enduring Eurocentric attitudes. Yet, to complicate things, I believe that it is not enough to transcend Eurocentrism by compensating it with paradigms from other cultures, as some scholars have tried to do. I would rather argue that we as translation study scholars should also enter into a more self-reflexive way of thinking and writing. Introducing China-based or Africa-based or India-based topics into our scholarly life won't change anything in the discipline's landscape and will, if anything, maintain clear-cut geographical research settings for as long as we have not questioned our own styles of life and consequently of thinking. We are all traveling, picking up ideas, concepts, patterns of thinking. We at least temporarily live in other continents, have pluricultural backgrounds. But how 
And with what degree of intensity do all these hybridizing factors impact upon our way of researching? What has to happen for our bodily enmeshed Eurocentric habitus to translation studies, as translation studies scholars to be shaken in our Eurocentric mindsets to be lastingly deconstructed? Does the mere use of the term Eurocentric not perpetuate it and petrify its manifestations? This is why I agree with Michael Boyden's critique in the same journal issue of labels such as Western and European as generalizing counterconcepts that perpetuate stereotypes of translation. The romantic idea that every language has a unique spirit of its own continues to pervade our intellectual and cultural production. The underlying ideology is certainly a monolingual one, yet monolinguality presupposes unique, homogeneous, monocultural spaces, or as they were historically called, national cultures. Multilinguality, the alleged counterpart of monolinguality and the proudly heralded asset of the European Union, does not look likely to become a reality in the near future, nor on an individual level due to or for reasons of sheer feasibility and not on a societal level because it is still, it will never correspond to realities like the migration processes that continue to shape present-day societies. Even if multilinguality, as its best, contributes to understanding the other, it nevertheless creates or fosters difference and separation. The other will always remain outside the reach of the self. What I would rather suggest as a concept to challenge the politically dominant and thus questionable forms of both monolinguality and multilinguality is heterolinguality. It was developed by Naoki Sakai and has widely been applied by Boris Buden and other scholars of EICPC, the Vienna-based European Institute for Progressive Cultural Policies. Heterolinguality does not see two or more pre-existing languages between which translation takes place, but rather understands translation as a social relation, as an activity opening up a field of differential, variously shaped and informed social practices. Once we think about translation in terms of social relation and social practice, Exploring translation processes cannot be reduced to the paradigm of communication versus miscommunication. Uh, it rather examines the effect of the various kinds of hybrid languages, broken languages, mixed code mixing or code switching, as well as the various ways in which those language uses are politically, socially, and economically informed, reaching far beyond the idea of different linguistic or cultural backgrounds. It is thus very close to the usage of heterolinguisme, as adopted by Renier Kutman and Rainy Maylards. But in Sakai's terms, thinking about heterolinguality particularly means um, that the foreignness of both addresser and addressee is taken as our point of departure, independently of their native language. I would claim that the concept of heterolinguality delivers a sound basis for discussing the question of Europe as a translational space. But in order to investigate the, this idea in more detail, let me first turn to the kind of translation concept we need to make fuller use of this trope. As we know in the various disciplines today, the notion of translation is drawn far more widely and is also far more significant than in the past. In the present day, the question of translation is also a question of representing the world, the imaginary constructions of memory, ways of relating to movement, 
to time, to space. And of course, it is still a question of circulating knowledge and sharing, sharing it on an equal footing. Against this background, Europe, and here I speak of Europe as a geo or socio-geographical space, needs translation. Although many would agree on that claim, very few are aware of how far-reaching its consequences are. One of the scholars who have conceptualized Europe as a space of translation is the French philosopher Etienne Balibar. Balibar is convinced that translation, certainly used in its widest sense, offers a vision of a new translational activity, sorry, society, of its common public space and its democratic political life. The common democratic European public, evoked by Etienne Balibar, is characterized by the following factors. I quote, the language of Europe is not a code, but a constantly transformed system of cross usages. It is, in other words, translation. Better yet, it is the reality of social practices of translation at different levels, the medium of communication upon which all others depend. As a consequence, the view of Europe as a translational space implies both a given space in which translation occurs and a space in translation whose speciality is determined precisely by translational social practices. Against such a backdrop, several questions arise. What kinds of social relations trigger translational practices in Europe today? In what ways are these translational practices thought of and represented? If translational practices are always linked to specific modes of address, then what are the dominant modes of address in present-day Europe? Who is addressed? And how is the course, the, is the, is, how is it addressed, is, is he or she addressed in the course of translation? How do these translations relate, these questions relate to the migration processes? And what is the role of heterolinguality in such contexts? These and similar questions apply equally to both a narrow and a wider concept of translation. And they also testify to the fuzzy border between the various kinds of concepts. I think they could form the backbone of a programmatic agenda for our society. I will come back to this in a moment. Interestingly, the trope of, European, of Europe as translation has not only been proposed by scholars like Etienne Balibar and others, but was also the title of a European research project in the period between 2008 and 10. The project was co-organized by the universities of Vienna and Paris and was entitled Europe as a Space of Translation with the acronym EST. For the co coordinators, EST meant, I quote, giving visibility to the role, tasks, responsibility, and work of translators as, culture, as crucial cultural figures, both within their own countries and abroad, and as decisive agents in the process of change in many, field, many fields. Even if this description doesn't tell us too much about the project's specific purposes, there seem to be some points of intersection between EST and est. I wonder whether even in Habsburg times, so sadly lacking in, an in, in internet access, it would have been possible to ignore the other as happened in this case. This brings me to my last point, a brief reflection on the impact of these thoughts for est's future. As I have tried to show, today's notions such as Europeanness or European culture are put harshly to the test. It is therefore a welcome development that societies such as EST are experiencing, are experiencing a critical assessment. Closely related to such critical introspection is a changing approach to translation. Translation can no longer be seen as a bridge between language or cultures, languages or cultures. 
This view only reinforces the notion of distinctive national cultures. Rather, border crossing. Um, as one of the main characteristics of global movements, including migration, entails translation labor, both between media and between different types of representation. The European nature of EST thus seems to be evolving into a trans-European nature by also involving those cultures which at least for most of the last hundred years have not participated in economic, economically globalizing structures. Being located within those structures could also mean being able to critically assess the validity, use and misuse of a European perspective on translation and to further expand its transgressive potential. So why should non-European scholars join EST? One of the reasons might be precisely that EST looks, or sometimes looks, beyond the European Union's borders, while still remaining more or less firmly rooted in some of the translation traditions that have nourished their, its history and given space to unique translation projects. As Europeanness might be precisely its focus on Europe's transgressiveness, which should aim to foreground the discontinuities and the ruptures so characteristic of present-day transnational social and political formations. In this way, EST and its members with their research and teaching activities will be able to break the deadlock of identitarian differences and the political practices based on them. So is Umberto Eco's dictum, the language of Europe is translation permissible? I would say yes, it is but only <clears throat> under the premise of a considerably extended view of Europe on the one hand and of translation on the other. We shouldn't forget that translation is an essential indicator for the existence of difference. When Foucault says, where there is power, there is resistance, we could say, where there is translation, there is difference. When talking about difference, however, it is essential to remember that, as Mary Louise Pratt and others have shown, the very concept of translation bears the irre irresolvable contradiction that in naming itself, it preserves the distances and distinctions it works to overcome. I'm afraid we will have to live with this kind of contradiction for a while to come. Yet, difference, at least as understood by post-structuralist thinkers, is not an essentializing category. On the contrary, it suggests ideas such as non-identity or postponed sameness. As such, translation will always exist because difference is a never-ceasing idea or practice. But at the same time, it is tied to continuous change, to transformation, to adjustment and to variation. By way of conclusion, let me therefore suggest that we foster within the European Society for Translation Studies a concept of translation which emerges out of taking positions from within, of distancing, of empathy, and perhaps of emotion. In such a way, EST may be able to contribute to shaping Europe's cultural legacy and to integrating it into the contradictions of new contexts, thus molding the metamorphosis of the translation field. Thank you. <laughs>